Welcome back. If you take the SAT and ACT during certain months, then you have the option to analyze the actual questions from the test after your scores come out. But only certain test dates offer this. Check out my video here where I outline the details of which months offer this feature and how you could use those reports as you prep for the next round. In this video, we'll cover some of the hardest topics that came up on the December 2020 ACT, also called Form D03. If you took this test, then this video will help you review some of the questions you might have missed. And if you didn't take the test, then it's a great heads up for what you might see on your upcoming ACT. So if you find this helpful, be sure to hit that like button, share, and subscribe. And check out my playlist where I review the questions from other recent SAT and ACT exams. This way, you can stay up to date on the most current material that appears on each test. Now let's get into some of the questions from the December 2020 ACT test. Now just a heads up before we start. For purposes of copyright law, we won't be looking at the actual December test questions themselves. However, I have written cousin questions, or exact replicas, for the questions that appeared on that test. So, for example, let's say that the real test had a question with a man in a rowboat going east at 30 miles an hour. I'll show you a question dealing with a man in a canoe going west at 40 miles per hour. I'll cover the same exact topic, but with different specifics. And this serves two purposes. One, copyright law. Unfortunately, I can't show you the actual questions from the test. And two, it's also designed to help you so that I don't give the question itself away. I'll walk you through the concept from the cousin question that I wrote, and that sets you up very well to then reattempt the actual question on your own. And by trying the real question independently, you'll be able to then pattern it in your brain much more clearly than just watching me do it for you. But it's also to keep everything on this channel legal and on the level. Okay, here we go. Let's start with some grammar. In a previous video, we've talked about how to use commas versus semicolons. Check out video 28 here for more detail. But briefly, you can use a comma between a full thought and a not full thought, in either order, and you can only use a semicolon between two full thoughts. This came up many times on the December ACT. Check it out on questions 23, 28, 37, 39, and 68. As you could see, it's very popular. On those questions, remember, you can't use a comma between two full thoughts, but you can use a semicolon that way. And this also brings up one of my favorite test-taking tricks. If you ever see two answer choices, where one choice is a period and one choice is a semicolon, and there's nothing else different about them, it means you can eliminate both. Think about it. A semicolon is for two full thoughts, and so is a period. They can't both be right. So as long as there's nothing else different between those two choices, a semicolon and a period in the answer choices cancel each other out. On the December questions that I just mentioned, you'll be able to use that trick on grammar question 28. So usually, a semicolon is used between two full thoughts, but there's a rare semicolon variation that occasionally pops up on the test as well, and this came up on question 21 from the December test. So let's slow down a bit for this one and look at a cousin question in more detail. In their first year of school, nurses learn to draw blood, wrap sprains, breaks, and fractures, analyze samples, and interact with patients. We touched on this variation in video 28 as well. Once in a while, the test will use a semicolon in a very specific way, not between two full thoughts, but to separate items of a complex series. In other words, between items of a list that already contain their own punctuation. So how does that apply here? Notice the semicolons after the word fractures and samples. That's a very important clue. Each item in this series is being separated by a semicolon even though they're not full thoughts. And why can we do that? Because look at that middle part of the sentence. They learn to wrap sprains, breaks, and fractures. Notice the comma after the word breaks. That's another important clue. It tells us that the items that they learn to wrap, sprains, breaks, and fractures, should each be separated by a comma. So looking at the larger sentence, we have a list where certain items within that list already contain their own punctuation. That means that each item in that larger series needs to be separated with a semicolon. So I'll give you a second. Press pause, try to answer. The answer is D. That separates each item of the larger series with a semicolon. They learn to draw blood, semicolon, wrap sprains, breaks, and fractures, semicolon, analyze samples, semicolon, and interact with patients. 
And we are allowed to do that because there's already punctuation between the items that the nurses learn to wrap. They learn to wrap sprains, commas, breaks, commas, and fractures. So you can use a semicolon to separate items in a list when the items within that list already have their own punctuation. Now, this is rare. The other December questions that I mentioned before deal with the normal variation of how to use a semicolon between two full thoughts. Question 21 deals with this harder variation. And for those of you also studying for the SAT, this harder variation also snuck into the Wednesday 2020 PSAT. So keep an eye out. It's rare, but it will pop up. Now let's get to some of the math topics that came up on the test. This one is a cousin of question 30 from the December test. In this right triangle, the sine of E is 5 over 13. If DF is 17, what is the value of DE? Let's start with the point that the sine of E is 5 over 13. What does that mean? Well, let's go back to SOHCAHTOA. Remember, SO, S-O-H, the sine of an angle, is its opposite over its hypotenuse. So in other words, the sine of E would be side DF over side DE, and that ratio would be 5 to 13. But wait, how is that possible? If df is 5, but then they tell us that it's 17, how can that be? Because the sine ratio is just that. It's a ratio. It doesn't indicate what the sides actually are. So in other words, by saying that df to de is 5 over 13, it doesn't mean that the sides are actually 5 and 13. It just means they fall into that ratio. So we can set up a proportion that 5 to 13 equals 17 over x. And then from there, cross multiply, x is 44.2. So just to recap, when they tell you that the sine, cosine, or tangent of an angle is a certain ratio, it does not mean that the corresponding sides are those numbers. It just means that those sides fall into that ratio. You need to set up a proportion. You'll see that on question 30. That's a very popular topic on both the SAT and the ACT. And so is this next one. This upcoming question corresponds to question 50 from the December test. So a cousin of question 50, what is f of g of 3? So with this function, you have what's called a composite function, a function within a function. And when they do that, you always want to start as far inside as possible and then work your way out. Let's see how. So let's not worry about that f for a second. Let's just start inside with g of 3. By saying g of 3, it means to go to where our x value is 3 and then read the g of x value. So an x value of 3 reading across that row would give us a g of x value of 1. That answer can now be plugged in to the f function. So by saying g of 3, we could really think of that as 1. It really says now f of 1. And that means we do the same thing. We go to where the x value is 1. And reading across that row, now we read the answer to the f function. f of 1 would bring us to the 3. The answer is 3. So if a question gives you a function within a function, you start inside and work your way out. The answer to the innermost function gets plugged into the next function. And just to pattern it in your brain, let's try another. What is g of f of 3? I'll let you try this one on your own. Press pause. Give it a shot. So remember, we have to start as far inside as possible. So let's start with f of 3. That means we're plugging in 3 for the x value. But this time, we're starting with a function f, not g. Plugging in 3 for x corresponds to an f of x value of 4. In other words, f of 3 equals 4. And now that answer of 4 can be plugged into the g function. So we could think of it that it really says g of 4. That means you would go to where the x value is 4 and read the g of x value. The answer is 3. Again, when they give you a function within a function, you start inside, and you work your way out. That's an exact cousin of question 50 from December. And moving right along, here's a cousin of question 51. The ratio of A to B is 2 to 3, and the ratio of B to C is 6 to 7. What is the ratio of A to C? It's tempting to say that A to C must be 2 to 7, since those are the numbers that they give us for those variables. But we can't say that. Why? It's because they're not being compared to the same common variable. Each ratio has a different value for B. Just to visualize this, a to b is 2 to 3, and b to c is 6 to 7. Notice how those b values are different. So we can't compare the a and the c just yet, but we could if we made those b terms the same. And we could do that by taking that first ratio and multiplying it by 2. That would now give us in that first ratio 4 to 6. And now notice that the b terms are common. 
now we can compare a to c. The ratio of a to c is 4 to 7. And this is very similar to what you'll see on question 51. So just to recap, when you're comparing two different ratios, you need to make sure that the common variable between them is the same. Now let's look at cousins of questions 53 and 56. They're both kind of like a sheep in wolf's clothes, meaning they look more complicated than they are. Here's a cousin of question 53. If ln b equals a, then b equals... This question doesn't involve any complex calculations, it just requires you to know a very specific rule of logarithms. Whenever you see ln, it's another way of saying log with a base of e. So this expression on the left can be rewritten as log base e b equals a. And then we just follow the law of logarithms. That would be e to the power of a equals b. So b equals e to the a. Question 53 from December is doing the same thing, just with different numbers. It doesn't involve any serious computation. It's just testing a very random rule of math. And ditto for question 56. Here's a cousin. How can you express the area of the triangle above? Usually, we would just say that area is base times height over 2, or 1 half base times height. But we can't do that here because there is no height, or there is no side that's exactly perpendicular to the base. So we have to use a different formula for area of a triangle. Once in a while, the test will slip in this formula. Area could be 1 half AC sine B. And what do we mean by that? It means we're taking two consecutive sides, A and C, and multiplying them by the sine of the angle that lives between them. And you could do that in any combination. In other words, you could also take sides A and B and multiply them by the sine of C, or sides C and B and multiply them by the sine of A. Again, same speech from question 53. There's no major math to do, they just want you to know a very random rule. The ACT does that a lot. But now let's look at a cousin of question 60, which is a little more difficult. After all, it is question 60. Here we go. One root of the quadratic polynomial ax squared minus 2x minus 8 is 2. Which of the following is a factor of that polynomial? This one's challenging, so let's take our time with each step. If 2 is a root of the polynomial, it's another way of saying that it's an x-intercept. In other words, if you looked at this picture on a graph, it means that 2 would be the x value where the y value is 0. So when they tell us that 2 is a root, it's just another way of saying that we can plug in 2 for the x and set the equation equal to 0. So it would look like this. Plugging in 2 for x would say a times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 minus 8 equals 0. And then from there, combining like terms and solving, we would get a equals 3. We can now plug in that value for a to the original equation. It would look like this. Instead of saying ax squared, it would say 3x squared minus 2x minus 8. And from here, they're asking us to factor. It's a little challenging to factor a trinomial where the a term is not 1. You could do trial and error with FOIL, or you could also do something called the AC method. But whatever approach you take, this trinomial will factor as 3x plus 4 times x minus 2. If you double check that with FOIL, it would lead back to the original expression. So the factors are 3x plus 4 and x minus 2. The answer is j. You'll see an exact cousin of that on number 60 from the December test. Just has different numbers. So just to recap, when they say that something is the root of a polynomial, it's a complicated way of saying that it's an x-intercept. That means that you can plug in that value of x and then set the y value equal to 0. And let's quickly hit some other topics from the December test that have already appeared on this channel. The December test covered many topics that we've seen on the channel before. For example, check out my video 35 here, where I cover some of the hardest topics that appear on both the SAT and the ACT. In that video, you'll find questions where I cover the following topics that appeared on the December 2020 test. December question 23 dealt with a part-to-part -part ratio, and then its harder cousin in number 40 dealt with stoichiometry. These both deal with converting units. Remember, in stoichiometry, you want to multiply so that your units in the numerator will cancel with your units in the denominator. Number 36 dealt with FOIL and imaginary numbers. Remember, whenever you get an I squared, it's going to become a negative 1. Question 43 dealt with reference triangles, and question 58 dealt with rules of the discriminant. I cover all of those topics in full detail in that video 35. Also, check out my video 30 here. In that video, I talk about some of the hardest topics that appear on the ACT. It includes a perfect cousin question of number 59 from the December test, which tested the equation of an ellipse. My question in that video is an exact replica of number 59. 
It just has different numbers, so definitely check it out. And everyone's favorite topic, how to work with a matrix. Check out my video 21 here, which covers this topic in great detail. Question 18, specifically from the December test, wanted you to subtract a matrix. But in that other video, I go through all of the details of how to combine a matrix with adding, multiplying, everything. Give it a watch. And the other videos as well, as they all cover topics that were fair game on December. So this video should help you with many of the questions that appeared on the December 2020 ACT exam. Whether you took that test or not, it's a great heads up for what you might see on your upcoming ACT. And if there's another topic from this test that's stumping you, leave a question in the comment section below. And be sure to check out my playlist where I cover other questions that have appeared on recent QAS and TIR reports. This will help you stay up to date with the most current material that appears on the SAT and the ACT. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.